was the first technology we were specifically involved in. Many of you here already know about it. That generator has now been duplicated in proof of principle and proof of commercial feasibility form from the description in the art in the world patent. The government of India has spent the last three and a half years in a program headed by Paramahansa Tiwari to show whether or not, number one, it was scientifically feasible, not by my claims, but by their experiments based on my description, and then whether it was commercially viable. The Kaiga Atomic Power Plant in Karnataka, India, of which Paramahansa Tiwari is the chief project engineer, is no longer the Kaiga Atomic Power Plant. As of January 1989, its name has been changed to the Kaiga Power Plant. Atomic has been dropped from it. Because as of January 1989, a panel appointed by Rajiv Gandhi has acknowledged the closed path homopolar generator to be commercially viable. This is in a country that has a very difficult time getting their hands on strategic materials. They don't even run this thing above 3,000 RPMs. In our Western nations, in Japan, in advanced technological societies who have access to materials, who have access to machines that get close to zero tolerance, it is not really such a big deal to be able to do much better it is somewhat surprising that the third world country, after three and a half years of research, has been the one to continue to confirm the existence of this technology and its validity. We decided in January of 1989, after these events had transpired, to pursue a solid state version of the technology. Now, this does not mean that the solid-state version of the technology is a solid-state homopolar generator, Myth, often said to be an in-machine, which is a misnomer I would like to discard forever. Michael Faraday invented the unipolar generator, the one-piece unipolar generator in 1831. Many of you already know this, but for those of you who don't, that's an important thing to understand. In the solid state reduction to practice, we are in an entirely new area of the reduction to technological practice. The solid state reduction turns out not to be so complicated. The first example we demonstrated, when I mention we, I mean my colleague and partner and friend, David Farnsworth, who happens to be the grandson of Philo Farnsworth, who happens to be the man who invented the television in the United States. In the solid state reduction we demonstrated at the UN on June the 7th, 1989, 29 and a half volts input, 4.65 amperes, 1600 volts output, 4.65 amperes, with no impedance losses. I didn't know I was coming here, for sure, until Wednesday. So, we will be very happy to receive into our laboratory bona fide interested parties. Boeing engineers have confirmed the functionality of our technology in the United States. But it is only a little step, a very little step, embarrassingly simple. We did not make a, ma a maze out of a straight road. Something complicated wasn't necessary. 
The same technology was demonstrated June the 12th at the United States Senate. You didn't hear about it. It's documented, it's in the congressional record, but no press was allowed. The demonstration was sponsored by U.S. Senator Timothy Worth of Colorado. All we have to do is in a resonant domain introduce a heterodyning wave or a standing wave properly and it increases the effective field density in a given electromagnet circuit. It increases the effective density of that field by orders of magnitude. We are only just beginning to scrape the surface. But long ago we left behind the heresy that more energy can't come out of a process than goes into it because we realize that every atom and molecule already represented a perpetual motion machine, the great heresy. Every atom and molecule already continues and has temporal integrity until it is otherwise destroyed, which you never destroy it, right? You dissemble it. The energy is conserved. Well, we're not not conserving energy. We're just dipping our cup into the lake. It has nothing to do with not conserving energy. Of course, energy is conserved. It's just that we have ignored 93 orders of magnitude of our own existence. It is not metaphysics, it is not religion, it is not philosophy, it's simple. It's simple, but it's also hard to conceive of. I mean, how do you think about 10 to the 93rd power grams per cubic centimeter? Who can think about that? An arbitrary volume in the midst of space. Everything is abundantly given. The politics of scarcity that have so belabored our planet to the point where we now, in the last year alone, in Brazil alone, lost 8 million hectares of forest because people thought they needed the land and the energy from the wood and the fires were out of control, 8 million hectares burned. 1.6 trillion pounds of oxygen production was lost. It is the politics of scarcity and the failure to recognize the implicit abundance in the physics of existence itself that has forced the extreme stratification of economies this is an abundant country. Many countries in this world are not so abundant. But India, within 10 years, will be energy independent. 880 million people who don't need fuel. Think about it. It's front page news in India. 880 million people who won't need anything to power their country. Now, are we going to say, oh yeah, that's good? It has to be done everywhere. Why? Because we can't afford, and we all know it now, 